Hi, I'm Chris Lewis, engineer for the Lakeville Fire Department, and welcome to another edition of On Call. The goal of this program is to educate and inform the citizens of Lakeville about how their all-volunteer fire department trains and responds to emergencies. Let's take a look at what's coming up on this edition of On Call. LFD has not one, but two new fire trucks. We will take a look at them and give you a behind the scenes look on how they were built. Next, Fire Chief Mike Myers visits a day training about how the department responds to hazardous material incidents. In Ask the Firefighter, Ryan Gephardt, a firefighter from Station 3, answers a viewer's question about medical helicopters. I will get you caught up on the latest happenings around the fire department and Spot the Fire Dog discovers what spontaneous combustion is and how you can prevent it from happening in your home. It's not every day the department gets a new fire truck, so it's a big deal when we do replace an old one with a new one. This year we are lucky enough to receive not one, but two identical fire trucks. These new pumper rescues are replacing two engines and a rescue truck and will be based at stations one and two. Originally, the trucks were scheduled to be purchased about a year apart from each other, but by waiting a year and having them built at the same time, the city saved a significant amount of money from sharing the engineering and other costs related to the building of the trucks. Recently, we took a drive up to the Rosenbauer factory in the city of Wyoming to give you an up-close look at how they build fire trucks right here in Minnesota. Well, Rosenbauer is a custom fire truck manufacturer. Um, we've been in business uh, un uninterrupted since 1929, and we custom build fire trucks right from the ground up. Everything is made right here in Wyoming, Minnesota. We also have a, another company that operates out of Lyons, South Dakota, operating as Rosenbauer, South Dakota. Together we form Rosenbauer America. We also have an aerial division that operates out of Fremont, Nebraska. So we actually are a global company. Our partner company is actually Rosenbauer International based out of Leoning, Austria. So worldwide we are the largest manufacturer of fire trucks. So we're building trucks at this facility here from anywhere from uh, Lakeville all the way to Saudi Arabia, Central America, South America. Obviously we're purchasing engines, transmissions, things like that and frames we're assembling, but beyond that, I mean, we'll, we custom build for every customer, you know, exactly what they want. It seems like every fire department wants something just a little bit different based on how they operate, and of course, whether they're a city department or a rural department. And generally, what we first do is, you know, after that first meeting is come back, meet with our engineering department, and put together a, uh, a sales blueprint, something that, that gives them a visual before we start putting this large specification together, we want to have the department be able to look at this truck and say, yeah, that's exactly what we want. You know, in most cases, it can take three, four, five, ten different revisions of the drawing to where we finally, you know, get that drawing nailed in to where, wow, that is, that's that's got everything we want on it. It's, it's the length we want, the wheelbase, things like that. And at that point, then we de develop the specification based on how the interiors of the shelves lay out, um, how the interior of the cab lays out. And uh, from that point, you know, it gets into more of the engineering process, the purchasing process, ordering materials. From when we order that chassis to when it comes offline right now is, is roughly in the five to six month area. But in all actuality, from when the guys in the chassis building start building the chassis, it's about three to four weeks, so it's a pretty quick process. Um, at the same time, same deal on the body side here, once we actually start on it, it takes us anywhere from, uh, I would say, seven to ten weeks to complete, you know, from start to finish, from where we're building the subframe all the way through painting the body to installing the fire pump. So what's happening today is uh, a couple weeks ago our production manager um, kind of came to us and said, you know, at this date the truck is going to be done. So at that point Bob will get with the customer and work together with them on a date that uh, works for everybody um, to come up and do the final inspection of the fire truck. So that's what the, the, the Lakeville Fire Committee guys are doing here today. They're actually inspecting these two completed fire trucks. I've had inspections that last anywhere from an hour to you know, a full day. And so these guys got a lot of work. These are big trucks. They got a lot of special stuff on them. And so they're probably, you know, going to spend most of the day here going over these two trucks. Um, what they will do is uh, 
Um, right now, they're probably developing a list of you know a few things they may want to add, something they may not have thought of. At the same time, there may be something that doesn't meet their expectations. We hope that's not the case, but it's a big truck. There's a lot of components on it, so it's not uncommon that you know the department comes up with a few things. Um, in this case, Lakeville, I think they have a city mechanic that also came up that has you know been on a creeper here rolling underneath the truck and you know has found you know a few you know wires that need to be tied up or maybe some airline connections that just need to be repositioned a little bit better to help the truck uh, hopefully last longer and have less maintenance. I guess in conclusion I mean what it comes down to is the department um, from the, the very beginning process to now I mean we work very closely with them throughout the process and there's a lot of questions that come up during the build but by keeping close communications with the fire department, inevitably they end up with apparatus that meet their needs, serve the community well. That's one of our mottos is helping, helping you serve your community because that's what it's all about. It's not the Lakeville Fire Department necessarily buying a truck or us it building a truck. It's working together you know, to, to build a piece of life-saving equipment that's going to serve Lakeville for you know, 20 to 30 years to come. That sure was an interesting look at how fire trucks are built, and I'll bet you didn't know they were built right here in Minnesota. If you want an up-close look at one of these new trucks, you will have an opportunity at our annual waffle breakfast on Saturday, July 9th at Station 1. Stop down for all-you-can-eat waffles, take a look at these new trucks, and support your local fire department. When we come back, Fire Chief Mike Meyer highlights a training session that deals with a hazardous material emergency. Hey, Phil! Oh, hey, Tank! How's it going? I'm feeling really drained today. Yeah, me too! Where is all this water going anyway? Unfortunately, on the lawns. Some people are watering every other day, even after it rains. Watering that much seems just wasteful. You're right, Phil. It is. Help out Phil and Tank by watering your lawn only when needed. Welcome to another edition of Chief Corner. I'm Fire Chief Mike Meyer. Today I'm joined by our new Assistant Chief, Todd Selner, who's not new to us at the department, but new to the position. Welcome, Todd. Thanks, Chief. Tell us a little bit about yourself, or your background, where you came from and such. I've been a member of the Lakeville Fire Department for 19 years, and before that I spent 28 years in the fire and security industry. Excellent. So today we just completed a training session on hazmat, so tell us a little bit about what we're doing as a department as far as hazmat training and, and what our operational level that we do. Well, being hazmat operational level, you know, we're training to respond to a hazardous material incident, more gas leaks, carbon monoxide, um, what we do to mitigate or at least contain and make the situation safe and the scene safe. So training today covered just kind of those things that you talked about, the has and like the gas line hits, which we see a lot of those in the summertime during construction, COs. And then we did some setup on decon today. So walk me through a little bit about that training today. Yep, in a hazardous material incident where bystanders may be contaminated with some type of substance, we, it is our responsibility to at least decontaminate them to a certain level, try to eliminate or get rid of the product off of their clothes and then off of their skin so that they can be transported to the hospital. So our training would involve, uh, when we're setting up for decontamination, we would, we'll have a scenario where we'll set up uh, two fire trucks uh, with, with a waterway between it or over it. So we will run down the, the patients coming down through there to wash them off. And from there, they will enter into a, a tent uh, for privacy to allow them to disrobe and we can then dispose of the contaminated clothing properly. And in a situation like this, we're generally going, we will probably call, we will call uh, the Dakota County Special Operations Team who is trained at a higher level than us to provide the technical assistance to help control and eliminate the hazardous material incident. 
So on a larger incident, the SOT team, the special operations team, would come in and provide that technical assistance. We're still going to support them, but uh, they're there to help us mitigate that, that incident, correct? That is correct. They, they have a higher level of training. They have more resources and tools available to help us mitigate that situation. All right. I think that about wraps up our training that we did today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. There's been plenty of activity around the fire department lately. Some good and some not so good. Let's start with some of the incidents that didn't make someone's day. The drivers of these two vehicles could have had a better day if they didn't have a little meet and greet at Flagstaff and County Road 46. Unfortunately, the driver of this vehicle on Interstate 35 had a really bad day when he collided with a semi. He was airlifted from the scene to HCMC and is recovering from his injuries. We did have a structure fire recently off of Hazelwood Trail in Southern Lakeville. The fire started on the upper level and was contained to a bedroom where firefighters quickly extinguished the fire. It didn't create that big of a fire but produced smoke damage to most of the home. Unfortunately, this family will be out of their home for a significant amount of time to fix the damage. The fire marshal is inspecting, but the cause of the fire has not been determined. We do have a few positive things to tell you about, starting with our annual blood drive. We had a great turnout for this event, and we thank all that stopped by to donate blood. About a week later, some of our firefighters and police officers participated in our annual Fields of Fire paintball event. All the money raised goes to the Lakeville Public Safety Foundation, which supports both LFD and the Lakeville Police Department. Walter Brands, a firefighter out of Station 2, was recognized at a city council meeting as the Lakeville American Legion's Firefighter of the Year. Congratulations, Walter. And we finish things off with pictures from the annual EFCE Vehicle Fair Picnic held at Mashad Park. Not only did the kids get a chance to check out some fire trucks, but they also looked at vehicles from the city's public works department. And that's just some of the things happening around the fire department. Todd's a great guy. I mean, look at him. What a sweetheart. Attaboy. Wait, Todd, what are you doing? How totally selfish and untod like of you. Come on, Todd. Come on, man. Hi, I'm Ryan Gephardt, a firefighter out of Station 3, and today's Ask the Firefighter question comes from Tyler. And he asks, who decides when a medical helicopter is needed to transport someone to the hospital? Thanks for the question, Tyler. On medical emergencies, not only does LFD respond, but also police and ambulance service. Once these first responders arrive, they have to evaluate the incident for how critical the situation is for the victims. All of these first responders have the ability and often work together to decide if a medical helicopter is needed for transport. In these cases, the victim has suffered severe injuries and need to be sent to a trauma center like HCMC or Regions as quickly as possible. When a helicopter is requested, our Dakota Communication Center calls a 24-hour dispatch line to see if one is available. If there is one ready and the weather is good, the crew will fly to the scene. By that time, firefighters will have set up a landing zone and be in communication with the helicopter crew during the entire time they are on scene. Once the patient is packaged, they will load up and take off for the trauma center. Lakeville's Air Lake Airport is home to one of these helicopters. North Memorial has based one of their helicopters at Air Lake since 2006, and it's common to see it flying to and from the airport any time of the day. Thanks for your question, Tyler. If you have a question for Ask the Firefighter, use the contact information on your screen. Dog, because I like to spot and stump 
oh, out the fires. Hey, I was walking around the town and I heard some rumors and some people talking about something called spontaneous combustion as it applied to fires. And oh, I just, I, it's bugging me. And I just wish there was someone that I could talk to about it. And oh, look over there in the fire parking lot. There he is, Fire Marshal Brian. Hey, I bet you Fire Marshal Brian could tell me all about it. Hey, Fire Marshal Brian! And Fire Marshal Brian, Fire Marshal Brian, Fire Marshal Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Spot, how are you? Hey, great, well, you know what, I was, Fire Marshal Brian, what are you doing in the middle of the fire station parking lot with all these chemicals? I'm sitting here reading the warning labels. You do have an exciting life, don't you? Yes, I do. It's very good. Well, hey, I thought I'd ask you a very important question. There was recently a call about spontaneous combustible fires. I'm wondering what is spontaneous combustion? I am confused. Spontaneous combustion is a chemical chain reaction where the chemical involved creates its own heat, which can start a fire if it's near combustibles. Oh my, you know, my first thought was spontaneous combustion was if you had the Toca Loco at Teresa's. Well, sometimes that'll cause it as well. Yeah, very good. Well now, what type of household products are you looking at over here? Are any of these possible spontaneous combustion uh, actually, chemicals? They, actually, they are. <gasps> we have a couple of different products here that are well known to the spontaneous combustion world. Yeah. Most notably, probably the one that you see is linseed oil. Oh. So why is the linseed oil uh, part of the spontaneous combustible combustion world? Linseed oil has characteristics in it that just create that chemical reaction. Um, much like paraffin wax, there are certain stains, a lot of oil-based finishes have the characteristics of creating their own heat, which can be very dangerous if not taken care of properly. And where should these be stored? I mean, obviously you want to have the cap and the covers on, but where should they be stored? In the house next to the furnace? Well, preferably not by the furnace. Yep. Typically we like to see them away from combustibles. The product itself isn't terrible until we use it with some sort of rag or paper towel. It's when we thin it out get it onto a paper product and then bundle up that paper, stick it in the garbage can thinking everything is good, your projects are complete, and three, four o'clock in the morning, your garage is on fire. Okay, Brian, what are some of the products that could spontaneously combust? As we talked about some of the wood finishing products, um, as well as some landscape products. If you're doing composting, that type of thing, probably notice that they do create their own heat. Um, if not stored properly, they can spontaneously combust. And the one that people are not aware of, and we've had several issues over the years with deck fires turning into house fires, are plant holders that are usually found on decks. Many times over the summer, it gets to be fall, you allow the plants and flowers to kind of just sit in that pot and they become ashtrays. The problem with that is it's not always what people think of as just soil. Obviously soil is, is not a big burn danger, but many of these pots have potting soil and which are basically contain peat moss. As that continues to decay, they become combustible and the only thing that's missing at that point is a little heat source, which many times people that smoke on their deck use them for an ashtray it will combust, and we've had several fires caused in Lakeville um, by this matter. Wow, they're very scary, very scary. Now with some of these products, how do you know if they're gonna spontaneously combust? Is there something written on the packaging that would tell us that? There is. On all the products that you use, I recommend flipping it around, look at the warning labels on the front or the back of the can. Sometimes they're in very fine print but anything that is susceptible to spontaneous combustion will be written on the warning label, either on the front or the back of the can. Now we're currently having an oily rag demo. We have this box filled with rags that had the linseed oil and it's uh, been in the box for about, oh, about an hour. Uh, what would we see happen, Brian, if we were watching this for like say another two, three, maybe four hours? I think if we had the means to have some sort of thermometer inside the box right now, we'd see a, a, a pretty good spike in temperature already. That will continue to rise in heat. Uh, the heat will continue and at some point it will reach its ignition temperature and it will just break into flames. That's amazing. I mean, you don't have like a uh, match 
or any type of a flint to start a fire. It just goes boom. It does go boom. Wow, that's amazing. Now, it, it seems like it's a kind of a dangerous product. How do you properly dispose of something like this? The one that I recommend is to have a metal can. Take those rags, fill the metal can full of water, and then have a tight fitting lid on it. Put all of the product in there, all of the rags in there, and then cover up that can. And that will take care of the ability for it to produce heat. The second one is if you lay the products out flat and let them dry properly. Lay them flat, don't bunch them up, preferably on concrete or on asphalt, away from your house. Uh, let them dry properly and the risk goes way down for the spontaneous combustion. You'll usually find it with the, the damp rags. Very good, very good. Well, Fire Marshal Brian, thank you so much for allaying my fears or allaying my fears about what spontaneous combustion is. And oh boy, if you don't mind, uh, I think I'm gonna head out of here now that uh, Taco Loco I had. Well, good luck, Spot. Spontaneous combustion coming soon. We'll see you next time, everybody. This is Spot the Fire Dog, because I like to spot and stomp out the fires. We'll see you later, everyone. Thank you, Fire Marshal Brian. Thanks for joining us for another edition of LFD On Call. If you have questions, comments, an idea for the program, or would like to send a question in for Ask the Firefighter, please dial 952-985-4700 or use the email address at the bottom of your screen. Thanks for joining us, and all fire units are clear.